Uh, the overarching theme of uh, the Kilconomics Festival is, is the crisis over? And um, we have a number of people gathered here. David McWilliams is uh, still with us, but we're joined uh, hot foot from Dublin by Pat Rabbit, Minister for Communications, Energy and Natural Resources, who's here uh, on two missions, one to be with us, and also a second one, which he will explain in a moment or two. Uh, John McGuinness, the local Fianna Fáil TD, uh, Chairman of the PAC, and also the Fianna Fáil Spokesman on Small Businesses with us. Good morning to you, John. Uh, we've got uh, Max Kaiser, he of the Kaiser Report, host of the Kaiser Report stateside, and we've got Bill Black, an academic and lawyer, and someone who put a lot of white collar criminals behind bars at the beginning of uh, this crisis. We heard about the tornado in Kilmainham. Uh, did you know there was a, a minor earthquake last night in Kilkenny? Did anyone hear that? The earth moved. Max Kaiser was on his honeymoon. <laughs> Where is that? It's absolutely true. <laughs> and it was the, the first night of your honeymoon, your wedding night you spent here. Absolutely, Kilkenny is the romance spot of Europe, as everyone knows. <laughs> and we lived up to that tradition. Very good. Well, congratulations to you, Aunt Stacey, uh, your beloved. And we might start with you, Max, though, anyway, on, on the yes. question of is the crisis over? Looking at us from afar, what do you think? Well, when I, the air, airplane landed, we got off the airplane, and there's people waiting, uh -huh. cars picking up, and I saw one for a Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts, uh, KKR. And um, they are basically what you call vulture capitalists. Uh, they are here as undertakers. Uh, the country of Ireland's assets have been bled dry and are being bled dry. And KKR and other private equity groups are here to pick them off for pennies on the dollar. And uh, so, th so that's a bit sad. Uh, it's like a wake, uh, unfortunately. But does it mean that they reckon the prices have now hit rock bottom, this is the time to get in and do their vulturing? Well, sure, but you lose your sovereignty, which is unfortunate, because that means the income producing assets of the country are going to be going to foreigners, foreign oh. banks, foreign companies. Uh, it won't be domestic. So uh, that's very sad to see. And that's part of the game plan because it's always been going back five, six years to pick off the smaller countries first, Ireland uh, being one of them, uh, bankrupt them, uh, impose debts that they didn't incur onto the population, and bleed it dry, and then pick off the assets for pennies on the dollar. It's what on Wall Street's called a leverage buyout. They use that technique on a country, Ireland, to do a leverage buyout of Ireland. Now they're here to take their reward and leave everyone else. Uh, dead broke. Sorry, but you've become fodder for Wall Street. <laughs> okay, so so we're not turning any corner anytime soon. Uh, you're bleeding. You're bleeding to death. Bleeding <laughs> to death. All right, Bill. From your point of view, uh, how do you see it? Well, as always, Max is uh, excessively optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Not to bring numbers into this or anything, but um, the Bank of Ireland, uh, two of its economists just issued a report, and it followed up uh, on a report uh, a few months earlier, and they decided they'd extend it and look at more dimensions, comparing the Irish crisis to other crises since the Great Depression. And the uh, results of both of these studies are consistent. You're number one. The absolute worst economic crisis in Europe in 75 years, and it's not even close. And in case you want to be optimistic, uh, they helpfully added that in prior severe crises, uh, real estate prices fell uh, typically from 10 to 15 years wow. after the event began. So uh, yeah, you've uh, turned a corner and ran into an abutment. <laughs> so that's how, how you see it, that uh, the end is not in sight, there's, there's no light at the end of that tunnel? Oh, well of course, you are the special children now. Uh -huh. Angela loves you. When Angela and the IMF love you, you know you have catastrophically bad policies. <laughs> right? Because uh, Ireland is unique in that it decided that it would bail out Germany. Right? You, you were not on the hook as the Irish people. So hang on, you're saying five million people were asked to bail out 70 million people? They weren't asked, they volunteered. That's how insane the policy was, right? You have a financial crisis in the banks. 
The deal with the banks, right? German banks have loaned money to Irish banks. And the deal is, if the Irish bank goes under, we get repaid cents on the dollar. And the subordinated debt, the deal was, you get repaid zero. Are you saying that that's the deal that all these guys who, when they lend money, they go in eyes wide open and they say, okay, we're, we're giving money to Anglo, we're giving money to Bank of Ireland, to AIB. We know what we are doing. We are taking a certain chance. They thought the risk was low. They were wrong. And, and they should the, pay. And they're the most financially sophisticated entities in the world. And they got a premium interest rate because they took the risk. Okay. And then you turn around and say, no, nah, why don't we gift you $30 billion, right? Ireland's a rich nation, Germany's a poor nation, why should we transfer $30 billion to you? And of course you couldn't pay for it. So you transform a banking crisis into an absolutely unsolvable budgetary crisis. Whereupon they say, you know what the answer is, austerity. We should make the recession worse, and we should cut your wages. We call this the road to Bangladesh strategy. So you've got to cut your wages so that you can outcompete the Spanish, who are cutting their wages so they can outcompete the Portuguese, who are cutting their wages so they can outcompete the Greeks, who are cutting their wages so they can outcompete the Turks. And this leads to the happy equilibrium, if you're an employer, of Bangladesh. It takes 10 to 15 years. But that's what this Max is talking about. Uh, this is part uh, of the Minister, is, is this how you understood the crisis when you took over in government? Or are they being too stark? Uh, well, there, I, I, I put it slightly differently. But yes, I, I understood it. Uh, yes, I understood it on a particular night on prime time where former Minister Pat Carey and myself debated it. I said exactly that night what the impact of us handing over our sovereignty would be and how it would tie the hands of incoming governments and against the background of the bank guarantee that uh, we were now in this situation. I mean, it is the worst, if you combine the impact of the recession uh, with the banking collapse, it is the worst recession since the Second World War, the worst experience that, that we have had. Uh, having said all of that, I mean, I, I don't think, uh, I wouldn't quite agree with, uh, with Bill or Max in the manner in they presented, uh, you know, I don't think that when the German banks poured money into the banks in this country after the Euro, uh, the creation of the Euro, I don't think that they did it deliberately in the belief that Ireland would bail out Germany one day. They did it because the banks here were gobbling up uh, cheap money uh, to fuel a property bubble that wasn't no, but, uh, sustainable. Uh, the reason we had cheap money was that Germany needed cheap money. We didn't need cheap money, we needed money at normal kind of rates of interest, but the German economy was in trouble, therefore, because in spite of what the, the finance minister says, Mr. Schauble says, um, that he's nothing to do with the ECB, they do dominate things ha that, that happen in the ECB. They needed cheap money, that meant Europe got cheap money, that meant Ireland got cheap money, that meant we had a boom. If there was no cheap money, no boom. Uh, well, Germany obviously is a dominant force. I mean, you know, we like to present it as a union of 27 equal member states. Uh, when it comes to a crisis like this, you discover it's not exactly equal. Of course, they're a dominant force. But the fact of the matter is that our banks uh, had a voracious appetite for swallowing up cheap money because they were funding an unsustainable property bubble. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, it was that cheap money uh, that transferred this liability. If it weren't for the bank guarantee, uh, mm. you know, the circumstance may very well be different now. But it was the period leading up to the bank guarantee where no action was taken. I mean, people have forgotten that there were uh, citizens queuing on the streets of Dublin because there was a run on Northern Rock Bank some 13 months earlier. So what happened between 13 months and September uh, of that year? I mean, uh, of the following year. I mean, uh, I say that because any minister for finance, and whether it was Pat Kenny or uh, um, 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 any of the economists here, 
confronted on the night with the leaders of the major banks in Ireland saying to Brian Linehan at the time, uh, if you don't do this, there will be a run on the banks in the morning and there won't be money in the ATMs and the banking system will collapse. Anybody presented with that, it's like being a bomb disposal expert uh, in, in Northern Ireland. There's a blue wire and a red wire. And if you cut the wrong wire, uh, you know, it is one huge risk. But my point is, ever since Northern Rock and in the uh, preceding 13 months, we didn't seem to do any preparation uh, for what befell us. And we didn't believe that it was, and we argued at the time uh, that it wasn't a solvency issue, that it was a, only a liquidity issue, and that it, the, the guarantee would never be called in. I mean, I remember saying in the House at the time that uh, uh, Brian Cowan had bet the keys, uh, the, the, uh, the deeds of the country uh, on the guarantee. And the almost cavalier approach at the time was, it'll never be called right. in. And uh, John McGuinness, um, they were your party in government. We know there was profligacy, we know there was lack of regulation, we know the early warning signs were not there, were not heeded, we know that, that the famous mantra of Charlie McCreevy, which was continued, when we have it, we'll spend it, when we don't have it, we won't spend it, all that sort of stuff, it was mad. Uh, it, it was mad, and there is no doubt uh, about it, but that, that Fianna Fáil-led government made huge mistakes that has led us to where we are. Uh, there were policy uh, mistakes, there were bad judgment calls, and they have caused, uh, or ha now have caused, a serious crisis uh, within the economy and the society uh, that Ireland is. Uh, in, in opposition, uh, you hear many things described as uh, a crisis, uh, a missed opportunity, but I have never heard the stark description that has been given to us this morning by Bill and Max. And it's interesting to listen to that from two outsiders viewing Ireland as we are right now. And it is quite clear that we are not being told the absolute truth, either by the government or by the leaders in Europe. But isn't it fair, from the government's point of view, and put it to the minister, that we don't have the absolute truth yet. We don't know what's going to happen to the promissory notes. We don't know what kind of a deal we're going to get. Uh, on our banking stroke sovereign debt. We don't know yet. We're promised we're the special child. Uh, there is an imperative for the Germans and their partners in the EU who are like-minded to see one country that's in a bailout become a success. And it seems that we are that adopted child. But all of the promises and rhetoric that we hear from Europe these days, particularly from Germany, will not feed that child. And society in Ireland is broken, families are broken, businesses are broken. You have heard this morning from some people in your audience as I came in, yeah. the attempts that they have made to get jobs, to get in, in employment, to reinvent themselves. So there is a resilience out there and there is a desire within the Irish people to get on with their lives and to get jobs. And we do it in an incredible way. For example, in this constituency today, there is a new business being opened. There is Plan B of breaking new ground on foreign markets against the odds, against the fact that China is in itself not performing as well as it should at 7% and so on. So we do all that, but there is another economy which was described for you this morning, which is the retail sector, the business people in Ireland, the indigenous sector of business people creating sustainable jobs, at one time employing 850,000 people. They are in serious difficulty. And the promises made with regard to uh, upward only rent reviews and legislation in that area came to naught by this government. In fact, the government itself has upward only rent reviews and the tenants have handed back the keys. <coughs> so I'm pointing to that to say that there is a ver very little understanding of the business okay. sector in this Our country and the different Minister, I want to go back to that point about not the full picture because the, 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 the uh, boys, Max and Bill, are saying that it is stark, it is catastrophic, we've been sold a pup. Uh, um, and I'm suggesting, and maybe you want to go along with this, that maybe the, we don't see the full picture yet and some of this catastrophic debt may be lifted. No, we don't, uh, we don't see the full picture yet. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that because we were in first, because the crash was deepest and first in Ireland, uh, we have found ourselves uh, burdened with private debt 
that the citizens uh, didn't incur okay. now, as, you... a, as a result of uh, ECB insistence. Well, this is what uh, I was going to ask uh, you. Can you enlighten and us about the, the strong arming by Mr. Trichet that night? Well, I, I, I don't know how, 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 uh, how, how wise it, it is to say how much, but I have no doubt but that we were strong-armed uh, at the time, or the then government was strong-armed uh, into uh, the appalling decisions that were made. And do you believe now, that that was because Mr. Trichet and his colleagues at the ECB knew what would happen if, if one, two, three or more of the German or French banks went well? I don't, I don't think that they knew, Pat, but they feared what the impact of contagion would be. I have reached the stage in my life, you know that, that comfortable stage when you were younger, when you always believed there was someone above you who knew what they were doing? <laughs> I, I have reached the stage in my life where I believe I know as much about it as anybody else. Okay. And I don't think they knew, but they feared the impact of contagion and they made the decision they made. Now remember, the Irish government was at that time, and had been for some time, entirely dysfunctional. And the ECB didn't believe Irish politicians then, or didn't believe the bankers then. The bankers were misrepresenting the picture in Frankfurt and in Brussels and so on. So as a result, the ECB uh, uh, um, uh, asserted the veto that they did. Now that means that, as a result, we are dealing with two legacy issues. One, and they're separate. One is the promissory note, and the other is uh, the uh, inherited. Uh, Would I be right in reading the, the tea leaves and, and thinking that the promissory note uh, job will become a 40-year mortgage or even a 50-year mortgage and will cease to loom large on the horizon? Is that a fair, a fair assumption, or is that just a, a a vain hope. Everything in this path has been two steps forward and one step back, and it is very difficult uh, going. It's very difficult going for a number of reasons. You're within sight of the finishing line, and something pushes you back down the queue. A bigger crisis in Greece or Spain or whatever it is. But yes, there is detailed, painstaking work going on on the restructuring of the promissory note. It seems fairly straightforward, you know. <laughs> I mean, explain to, to Mrs. Merkel about the, the war reparations World War One that she yeah. finished off paying last year. Yeah. It's the same sort of principle, yeah, you know, and, and uh, yeah. why she can't just, you know. It's, 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 it's a very straightforward very issue to make that point, but it's, uh, you know, if, if you're greeted with, uh, uh, you know, resistance in, in different institutions uh, of the Union, it is difficult. On the second issue, of the of the debt, and, and, and uh, well, the situation on the debt is that we are uh, making definite progress, in my view. All right. The decision of the 29th of yeah. June, Pat, has not unraveled. Right. That is the legal Ireland form of is the position, a special case. and that I is to very important. Bill and David is listening to this with uh, his eyebrows arched. No, my, my, my quick comment is that the prime minister needs a girl pair. Yes. Okay. You know what I'm saying? He needs to stand up for the country. Testicular growth is what you Suit. Now, you know, people talk about the policy mix that was incorrect. They're not bringing up the F word, fraud. There was a massive fraud. And, you know, here you have a guy, Sean Quinn, who's in the paper today. Now, his case is before the courts, and we will not have a yeah, I'm not, I'm not concatenating my word fraud with Sean Quinn, okay? I'm not making that connection. That's just a coincidence that I mentioned the word fraud. And then I mentioned fraud. That was just a mere coincidence, a limerick, if you will. <laughs> Certainly no one on this program would there go along with such a contention. There was a guy who was a jerk, and then he... No, I'll leave that to the... To, so here, but here the headline is, Warning of civil unrest if Quinn is sent to prison. And I thought immediately, like, oh, wow, people are finally getting in the streets to hang this bastard. It turns out that, no, it's the other way around. If he's in... If, if he said, you know, people will support him. They support him. Now here's the next headline in the very same paper. Intruder raped me, then asked for a hug. <laughs> same principle. Same principle. Sean Quinn raped me, asked for a hug. Are you insane? Okay, so we've been focusing.
focusing on really bad Irish decisions, right? Greatest own goals in the history of Ireland. And, the, you know, there's a fair history of own goals in, in Ireland. But the spectacularly bad decisions are being made by Germany. Explain. Germany has thrown the entire Eurozone into an utterly gratuitous recession with this absolutely insane austerity principle. So why will you have any confidence that they will actually reach the right decision when it comes to okay. Ireland? As you say, there's a straightforward, there are a number of straightforward <coughs> answers to what should be done that should have been done years ago if Germany were rational. Okay, the point being that if they wreck Europe through austerity, no, they it, have wrecked. It's okay. not a conditional <laughs> subjunctive. <laughs> okay, but, but that point being that if if Europe is not functioning, if it is not economically yet. dysfunctional, Europe is in recession, completely gratuitous. It means Germany is effectively damaging itself. But it's interesting if you if you talk about and everybody talk about, else. We started we started with this idea that uh, there was this expression: when I have money, I spend it. When I don't have it, I don't spend it. And there was an assumption that that's a, a bad thing to do, that policy doesn't make any sense. This is exactly what we're doing now. When we have money, we spend it. When we don't, we don't. So when we have money, we exacerbate the upswing, it becomes much more flamboyant. When we don't, we exacerbate the downturn, the austerity. It seems to me that what's going to happen here, the, this is all a phony debate, a phony war, because ultimately what is going to have to happen in Europe, which we will benefit from, is the ECB is going to have to behave like a proper central bank, like the Federal Reserve in the United States or the Bank of England, which means it will have to buy the treasuries of the countries, i.e. they will have to go in and give money to the governments, number one. And number two, the fiscal compact will eventually be torn up, will eventually be torn up, because Europe has 25 million people on the dome, 25 million. It also has interest rates at 1% in Germany. If that doesn't scream a government expansion, nothing does. And this will be solved like the 1930s was solved in the United States by a central bank injecting ample liquidity and by governments spending to bring the economy's demand up, to kickstart the economy. This is what's going to happen. Germany at the moment is leading itself and everybody up else up a garden path. Right. And, the, and the model is German unification. Okay, German unification was a success because Large Germany spent Greece. its way out of it. All right. And I that's to going to happen again. I want to go back to, to Bill and Max just on one thing. I mean, the, the wasteland that you both have laid out in front of us. If what uh, Minister Pat Rabbit and his colleagues in Cabinet are, are trying to achieve in terms of the promissory notes and in terms of the other debt being treated in a special way because we were strong-armed into doing something we shouldn't have done. If we get a result on that, what then, Bill? Will we be okay? No, you'll be a little less bad. And when, and, you know, when I pointed, painted that picture, that wasn't Bill Black. That's the Irish Central Bank's picture, right? So let's remember that. Uh, but you would be less worse off, that would certainly be true, if they uh, had less punishing austerity. But the regime would still remain austerity. And here, you know, back to the hug me uh, point that Max is making, there have been two things put to the Irish people for a vote. And you voted <laughs> insanely on both of them. So you had voted in favor of austerity, with the uh, stability of growth back, right? Yeah. And you voted against an inquiry. I mean, it, so no one's being held accountable. You're talking about the, the Doyle, uh, uh, the Oireachtas Committee's uh, referendum that we rejected. Yeah, I wasn't going to butcher the pronunciation of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Max, what, yeah. is, what is your view in terms of we get well, some sort that, of deal? Ireland closed the, the embassy in the Vatican for, for, for reasons yeah. of pedophilia oh. and rape, and they should uh, do something similar with these banksters. Uh, who are financially raping the country. You should, you should take a stand against them. You know, in France, they're passing legislation now to classify crimes of this type as uh, pornography and pedophilia, to apply a stigma, a negative stigma, to financial rapists like the gentleman I mentioned earlier and another one named Sean. Um, so that when they go down the street, people uh, look at them and say, they look at them like they would look at Jimmy Savile over in the UK. We, we can't really make those kind of comparisons uh, in this jurisdiction. Uh, it is not uh, well, appropriate. Because we're using rape, rape and that, that analogy is not one that we, 
we would choose. And, the and fact it's, that so, we it's so apt, Pat. It's so apt. It's I, so I understand, true. I understand, it, Max, the people are in pain here. Imposing uh, insurance levies on us because of the bad behavior of the, the Quinn Insurance Group is effectively financially... Who runs this country, Pat? The government, the people, or some schmuck bankster? Okay, John. <laughs> our case and tells us that we are a special case. It also looks at Italy, which is in deep trouble, supported by its black economy. It's looking at Greece, which is a basket case. Spain, which has yet not given up the true figures. We don't know what's happening in France in terms of their 30 billion euro deficit and their pensions. Their automobile industry is in trouble. People are leaving that country. Uh, and they, they are looking at us and wondering what is happening in the other countries. And we're not taking into account what the UK government are doing. We're not working with them, or closely enough with them, to determine why they are so anti-European. And we are not looking at the budgets of Europe, which essentially are ripping off every country that is a member, because it is, it is now costing a colossal amount of money to run Europe. So G Germany is there in the middle, trying to, as it were, hold the centre, <coughs> while everything else is falling around us. And the truth in Europe is not being told. And therefore, we are being just kept on a string in this country. Yes, and can, I, can I just agree with the other speakers? <laughs> it is now becoming an embarrassment uh, to see our ministers and their Taoiseach go there cap in hand. And I appreciate what Pat would say, well, it's been the false fault. But it's embarrassing to see Angela Merkel or to hear her say yesterday, you're doing a great jo job, lads. There's a tap on the back for you, and we'll all come out as a stronger for it. Well, that is no not doubt. true. Uh, there's no doubt we're in, in dangerous times. I mean, in our lifetime, the colonels were in control in Greece uh, and uh, indeed in Spain. Um, uh, people at the bottom of the pile in Greece at the moment are hungry. One in every two young people under 25 in Spain are unemployed. Uh, it is a very dangerous and fragile situation. Having said that, Pat, uh, I believe that you can point to very significant and substantial progress since Draghi took over the leadership of the ECB. There have been a number of very major changes, and I think that there is evidence that at the top of the institutions in Europe now, there is an appreciation that the crisis has become so serious that solutions okay. must be well, One last thing, and, and this is a point Bill made last night, in terms of rescuing this economy, you've got to put money back in people's pockets. And he's saying that there is debt, personal debt, mortgage debt, that is unsustainable, and they've got to start writing off debt. We heard AIB saying they're doing it on a piecemeal basis, dealing with people one by one, and they are writing off debt. They were given billions and billions to write off the debt. They've used less than a, less than a billion of that to write off debt. They're not doing what we paid them to do out of taxpayers' money. The progress is uh, is very slow, just like it's very slow on lending, especially to the SME sector. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the personal insolvency bill, uh, which is designed to deal with the personal indebtedness issue, including secured, i.e., in this okay, case, but, uh, mortgage uh, debt, just a second, will Mr. be finished next week. Bill, you made the point that corporation to corporation, when they, they reach difficulties, they deal with it in a very mature and efficient way. Explain. Yeah, this is called a troubled debt restructuring, and you routinely, business to business, write down the principal, reduce the interest rate, because it's better to be paid something than to have the thing default, and there's no moral connotation to any of this. None of this moral hazard stuff. Right, and blaming the uh, borrower uh, and such. So, you know, fundamentally... So banks yes, and their customers should behave like business to business. They should, and fundamentally, look, what it comes down to is, you, you talked about the unemployment rate. In Spain and Greece, over 50% of young people. Why is the unemployment rate for Irish young people falling? Is it because the economy is recovering? It's because people are voting with their feet. That there is not a future for me. That when what I do when I grow up, I go to university, I get my passport, and I go. Exporting human capital. That's what we're doing. The sick old joke that okay, the Irish Minister, leading as, export as is the Irish. Happens, Pat, the banks continue to put taxpayers' money to their bottom line and improve their position.
their pensions and they are not considering the citizens of this country are their customers. Uh, Minister, I won't let you go before you tell us what your other mission is. Well, I'm here to do uh, a couple of things in relation to the Children's Amendment, uh, but I'm also down at the Father McGrath Centre where uh, my own department uh, funds a scheme on digital inclusion, uh, a scheme which is designed to facilitate people who didn't have the opportunity uh, to get a, a basic element of computer literacy might be left behind. at the earlier stages of their lives, and now uh, through voluntary groups of one kind and another, uh, this scheme permits people to acquire uh, basic computer literacy and to, you know, use the internet, whether it is just as the point has been made about immigration, to make contact with their children in Australia or Germany or whatever it is. People generally appreciate it, and a, for a small amount of money. It has trained some 40,000 people. Okay, well, Minister, thank you very much. I wish you well in that endeavor. We let the Minister go. I want to talk to Max Abdill about uh, uh, presidential politics, uh, American presidential politics, for a couple of minutes uh, after 11. Uh, but now we'll take a break. <laughs>